shine in the shadows and you win every battle nothing can stand up So today our, our teaching is called commission or commission. And um, Jesus said, you know, on those, those few days before uh, he was crucified. He tells his disciples, um, hey, I've got to go, but that's a good thing. Ja musím ísť, ale je to dobrá vec. It's actually better for you that I go. Je to pre vás lepšie, aby som odišiel. Because when I go, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to you. Lebo ja keď odídem, uh, tak vám pošlem môjho Ducha Svetého. And in that same conversation, a počas toho istého rozhovoru, Jesus tells his disciples, when I go, don't worry, I'm still going to be working. A keď teda uh, odídem, nemusíte sa I'm going to be working through you and you're going to do even greater things than I have done. And I don't know if you ever got to that part in the scriptures thinking, what? I'm going to do greater things than Jesus? Because if you haven't been paying attention the last couple of years as we've been teaching through the life of Jesus, he does some pretty amazing things. What are those, wor- those things he says, the works I have been doing? What are those bigger things? And, and he wants us to know these things. And not just know them, but do them. And he wants to do them through us. Today is the story of the ascension. You know, the story where Jesus, he has completed the work that God the Father has called him to do. And before he goes, he has some last words for his disciples. Some last instructions. And not just for his disciples, but I think it's for all of us. And um, sometimes this passage that we're going to look at is called the Great Commission or the Great Sending Out. Um, I like to think of it more as the, the co-mission, like the, the mission that we do with him. Uh, 
slone, ale ja by som sa na tým chcel skôr zamýšľať ako na spolu vysiel s ním. Because the, the context is, it, or the, yeah, the context is, it's all this thing that we do with him. Alebo v tom kontexte, ak sa to nachádza, tak je to o tom, že to robíme všetko s ním. And you'll see as we look at this mission that if we didn't do with him, it would be an, an impossible mission. A uvidíte, že táto misia, keby sme nerobili spolu s ním, tak by to bola nemožná misia. And it's a mission that we wouldn't even probably embark on. A nebola by to ani misia, ktorú by sme podstúpili. But we do it and we can do it with him. Ale robíme ju a môžeme ju robiť s ním. So this story of the ascension uh, and these last words are recorded in most three of the gospels. Uh, we're going to be in mostly in Matthew 28, so if you have your Bibles, open there. But if you're a student of the Bible, I also encourage you through the week, read through Mark's account in Mark 16. Luke 24. It's also recapped in Acts 1. And we're going to bring some of those verses in, but we're going to focus mostly on Matthew 28, so have your finger there. And so we're going to Matthew 26, sorry, Matthew 28, verse 16. And it goes like this. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And then we get these last words um, in verse 18, these, this command or this mission. It says this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely, truly, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So these are these last words, these parting words that Jesus has with his followers. This is his last instructions or command for them. And he outlines that mission, right? But I love how Jesus does it. Because he kind of has like bookends, things that hold the mission together. And it's himself. Right? It's characteristics of himself. And these bookends are, it's his power and his presence. And it's his power and his presence that motivates us to even do the mission. And make it even possible. So we're going to look at that briefly. So in uh, verse 6, sorry, 18, Jesus speaks about that power, right? He says, some authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Is that true? No, right. What did he say? All, right? All authority in heaven, between heaven and earth, has been given to me. You realize that's a lot of authority, right? 
You know, I mean, we see, you just open up the news and you see countries vying or fighting for authority over small little space. <laughs> and they'll have a war and then they'll possess that land for a few years and then it'll be another war, right? Jesus says, I have all authority, everything between heaven and earth. This is not just in heaven and in earth, not just between. Yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's not just political authority. It's authority over everything. You know, he's the power that holds the universe together. He's the one that can control all things. It's all in his hands, right? We read earlier um, at the beginning of the service from Ephesians 1, right? And I think the Apostle Paul was just blown away, right? He's like, I want you to see what I see. I want you to see this uncomparable power that God has. He used words like there's no, there's no strength, there's no dominion, there's no power, there's no nothing that compares to him. There's no name that is bigger or more important or, or more powerful than his. So it's like not now and not ever in the future. He's placed all things under the feet of Jesus. And that's what Jesus is talking about, right? I like how Jade, he led us in prayer to see ourselves as God sees us. And many times, like he said, we don't see ourselves correctly, right? But Jesus sees himself correctly in this moment. He knows who he is. And he knows what's at his disposal. He has all power between heaven and earth, everything. And after saying this, he throws in one little word. Therefore, because of this, because of the awesome authority that I have, I want you to do something. I want you to respond. And this is really what, you know, our motivation for the mission. Is that God is amazing. That he has all power between heaven and earth. He is, you know, he's awesome. Right? And moving into the mission is our response to his awesomeness. So that is that one end of the bookend, you know, the, the power of God. But then we have the other end. And that's his presence. And he says at the very end, after he gives the mission, he says, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. The very last verse, verse 20. He says, he says, I have all authority and I'm with you. That should actually bring us a lot of courage. In, when, you, when you realize that you've got the master of the universe with you, 
Keď si uvedomíš, že majster a vládca celého vesmíru je s tebou, and he's saying, hey, let's go do this. A hovoríte, že poď, ideme to to robiť. I'm not sending you on your own. Nejdeš do toho sám. I'm actually going to come with you. Ale ja tam pôjdem s tebou. And when I come with you, I bring all my authority with you. A uh, keď tam ja pôjdem s tebou, tak do toho vložím celú moju autoritu. That, I think if we have that mindset, that changes our witness and that changes our gospel preaching a lot. When we know who we go with. So we're going to look at that mission that's kind of smacks between those two bookends. There's a I think there's four, four basic things we're call, called to do. The, the first one is it's kind of obvious, but sometimes we don't do it. He says, go. He says, go. Right? He doesn't say, sit in the church. He doesn't say, write a blog. He didn't say, think about mission and evangelism. This is actually a command, it, a command to action to get out. I like Mark's gospel. Some manuscripts have this in Mark chapter 16, verse 8. It says, Jesus himself also sent out through them. Jesus himself went out through them. Okay? So he, the gospel, Mark's gospel is very um, specific about this. That Jesus sent his disciples out but he was working through them. Okay, he was very clear about that, okay? I don't know about you, but do you know that you've been sent? Do you feel like you've been sent? Or do you, maybe sometimes we share our faith because we feel like, ah, I got it, that's what I'm supposed to do. I've heard that somewhere at church. I should do it. But Jesus is saying, he's actually sending his guys out. And I think if we remember who's sending us out. That this powerful lover of our souls is sending us out. And that he wants to do things through us. That it'll change the way we do things. I don't know if anyone ever shared their faith and it was really awkward. A few of you are shaking your head. <laughs> All right. And sometimes it's awkward just because it's just, yeah, it is, right? <laughs> and sometimes it just is because we make it that way, right? You know, where we, we're trying to share with someone and it's not really maybe the moment to do that. Where we're, we're, in a sense, we're kind of sending ourselves out to do the work. And, <laughs> and we're doing it um, maybe out of the wrong motivation. Or under, in our own strength. And instead of just inviting Jesus' power and his presence. I remember, well, this is a little kind of a part of our knowing one another. So we met each other on a missions trip. And I remember we were being told, like, when you go witness to people, because we're doing street witnessing. Go in, go in pairs. When you go share, 
And the other one you pray like crazy, okay? <laughs> And just pray for the power. Pray for his presence. Because you can't do anything. You don't have much to give. Whatever kind of wisdom you think you have, you're not, you're not that smart, okay? But God is amazing. And he will give words that you don't have. He will give uh, a, a presence that you don't have. He will do what he always does. He will seek and save the lost. But you can't seek and save the lost. But he can. We're called to go. We're called to go out of our spaces and, and talk to people. But with him. I don't know if that's your mindset. I think our mindsets tend to be something different. Mine is many times. Trust me, this teaching is for me, not just for you. It's mostly for me, okay? I think sometimes we have the mindset of stay. Or bring someone to church. Or you come to me and I'll share you something. But this mindset is not a biblical mindset. It's not the model that Jesus and the mission that Jesus gives us. I know we do this many times and this is and, and it's not a bad thing to do. Um, is I think we have the mindset of hey it would be great to bring someone to church. And if they come to church they'll hear something about Jesus. And God will get their heart and they'll get saved, right? <coughs> And that happens, right? That's a great thing. Keep doing that, okay? But that is not what Jesus is telling us to do here. He's not saying bring people to church. He's not saying bring people into your zone. He's telling us to go out. He's telling us to go to other people's turf or zone. He's telling us to bring, not bring people to church, but bring the church to people. Because the reality is, there's a reason that there's some empty chairs here. <laughs> there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people in our city who will never go into a church ever in their life. They don't want to come to church, okay? But they might want to hear from you. Because they're your friend or your, they're your co-worker or whatever. They're okay to meet in the work, in the pub, in the cafe. But they have no interest in coming to this particular space. Okay. And that's fine because that's not part of our mission to bring them here. Our mission is to go out and tell. We see how far we need to go out. We're told to, um, in Mark's gospel says, go to all the world. Go to all creation. I like it Acts. It says, go to the ends of the earth. And some of you have done that. Jade, coming to Slovakia the first time, did it feel like the ends of the earth? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you came first time on mission here, yeah? Or one of the first time, yeah? Okay, well, you know. Yeah, it ended up that way, right? <laughs> okay, 
So, ends of the earth, right? Some of you didn't even know where Slovakia was before you got here, right? <laughs> By the way, it's, I, love, I love this and I see it all the time in our church. How sometimes some of us come here because of work or because we're students or whatever, right? In, you know, but if you're a believer, just remember that the Lord didn't send you here to Slovakia to be a student, just to be a worker. He's brought you to this end of the earth for a reason that is more than getting an education or a paycheck. He wants to do something in you and to you and through you. So if you're here, you've got a job, okay? And he tells us who we speak to, who, who's the target audience. It says all nations, all races, all peoples. Now for those first disciples, they're all Jewish. This would have been a pretty radical statement. Because Jews kind of thought like, hey, God's for us and not really for anyone else. So when the Messiah says, actually, I'm for everybody, that my good news is for everybody, that's a pretty radical statement for them to hear. And we see, actually, as you track through the, like, for example, through the book of Acts and then the other New Testament books, you'll, you'll notice that the, the early church didn't naturally come to this idea of, hey, let's go to the ends of the earth. They didn't necessarily think, hey, let's go talk to everyone about Jesus. They were great about talking about Jesus in Jerusalem. But they weren't so great about going further than that. You know what pushed them out? What scattered them out? It's persecution. Right? The, the temperature had to get turned up <coughs> for them to actually be obedient to Jesus. But, but when that happened, we see they, they went to Judea, kind of the neighboring area. Then they went to Samaria. They went to places like Peter went up to Caesarea Philippi. Begins to um, gets this vision where Jesus tells him, go speak to this centurion, this Roman guy. And the centurion, Cornelius, he and his whole family, his whole household become believers. Peter comes back from that experience saying, now I know that Jesus is for everybody. More persecution happens. Some believers get kind of run up to a city called Antioch. And then they just happen to speak to some Greek people. They get saved. And church gets established there. Later on in the story, this church in Antioch, they're praying. Holy Spirit tells them, send Paul and Barnabas. And then, then in an amount of like 20 years or so, there's churches all over the Roman world. And if that wasn't enough, Jesus works through his disciples. And they get spread out all over the place. 
They're going to places like Egypt, Ethiopia, Morocco. Thomas goes as far as South India. Okay. <laughs> right? And the gospel explodes, right? For everybody. Right? And this going requires that we kind of get out of our boxes, right? Get out of our comfort zones. It requires us not to be silent about our faith in places where we don't necessarily want to share our faith. And it challenges our prejudices sometimes. Or our fears or our insecurities. Going out is, is a, a leap of faith sometimes. And I think that same command of going out and speaking to everybody applies to us. And I would say in, in our context it's not only all peoples like in terms of ethnicities. You know, and go do that, okay. <laughs> But it, it might be going to, to peoples that we normally wouldn't go to. Where we might need to cross political lines, you know? You know, you know who, who wants to go to speak to the neo-Nazis here in Slovakia? <laughs> Anyone feel like naturally you want to do that? <laughs> Swap, <laughs> right? You know, not a little bit out of the comfort zone, right? <laughs> But maybe God wants to bring a revival through you, right? Uh, you know, maybe it is social lines. Maybe it's sexual orientation. You know, where Jesus wants to be known everywhere. You know, beyond these barriers that we put up. Uh, this true story, something that's happening right now. I love it. There's, um, I don't know if you know this, but in Slovakia, specifically in the east, there is a great revival breaking out. It's been going on for a few years now. And it's going on in the Roma, the gypsy community. You know, where there's been some missionaries, I, the couple, uh, I know a couple guy, uh, a couple who are, sorry, a married couple who are uh, Americans, actually, or Canadians, Canadians, I think, yeah. Anyways, they're from North America. And they're just serving these Roma people. And there's these, there's this, like, revival going on where these, all these villages and all these families are getting saved and huge churches. This goes from people just willing to cross those lines and go with Jesus and watch what he does in a place that may not be comfortable for them normally. So when we go, let's go with God. Because Jesus says, surely I'm with you to the end. I'm not just starting the, the journey with you, I'm going with you all the way. I got to pick up the pace here, okay? So, um, what do we do when we go? I think it's pretty obvious we're supposed to share the gospel. Mark tells us they went out into all the world and they preached the gospel. 
This word he uses for preach, it's to herald. I don't know. It's like when a king sends you out to give an official authoritative message. So basically the king of the universe is saying I'm giving you my authority to go out and share my good news. Remember that is what our message is the good news, the gospel. In that same story from Luke's account Jesus defines what the gospel is. We see it in Luke 24, verse 47. It says, preaching the repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That is what we're supposed to be preaching. Okay? Is that Jesus forgives. Jesus forgives anyone who wants forgiveness. The message is really simple. That's it. Okay? And so, I encourage you, when, share it and share it with authority. I know sometimes, and I'm not, I don't want to knock this or put it down. You know, I, I know sometimes people give tracks. Or they give like a survey or something. <coughs> or maybe we'll create some kind of event, you know, where we're doing something. And then eventually we'll maybe talk about the gospel. I'm not saying that those things are necessarily bad. But for some reason it doesn't ring kingly authority to me. It seems more like I'm scared and I don't want to talk to you, so I'm going to give you something. <laughs> That's not how a, a herald communicates the message, right? A herald comes in the room and he's like the boss, okay? Because he knows... He knows who's behind him. And he can say it loud, he can say it clear, he can say it with authority, without fear. So we're called when we go out to preach the gospel. Keep it simple. Speak it with authority. But we're also, we see in Luke's gospel something else. It says, you are witnesses of these things. That is the other thing. When we preach, we need to witness. Witness is just you share what you've experienced. And I love that we have preaching and witnessing together. Because when you share the gospel, when you tell people Jesus can forgive, and he will forgive, he, he, he can and he will. And then you couple that with your own personal witness. What you're doing is saying, I'm the evidence. I'm, I've experienced that. This is my story of how he has forgiven me. This is not theory. This is my reality. That adds so much credibility to, you, to your message. You can say, I've experienced that freedom. I've experienced the power in the presence of Jesus. And that changes the message radically. So put those two things together. And we see in uh, Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 16, verse 20, 
So as the disciples went out and they preached everywhere. So as the Lord worked with them. And he confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. We're not going to get into that, but basically you can read it in the book of Acts where just God was working powerfully through these guys. So we're going to go faster. Sorry, we're going along. So first thing, go. And as we go, we preach. But we also make disciples. Notice it didn't say go make churches. Don't go make Christian organizations or charities. It says make disciples. Make those who follow the Master, follow Jesus. Uh, make those who become like their master, like Jesus. <coughs> And disciples are also those who carry the yoke or carry the, the message of the master. That is what Jesus wants as the result of our preaching. And there's a result of our and the result of our witness is that people would become disciples. I don't think Jesus is really that concerned about how many seats are filled in the church. You, you realize you can have a, a room full of people and have no disciples? Because honestly, if you're not a disciple, you're just an audience. Jesus doesn't need an audience. He doesn't want an audience. He wants disciples. You know, those who relate with him and become like him. And carry his message forward. And he wants to use us to make those disciples, right? Discipleship is not a, a program or a class or, you know, some, yeah, something like that. We look at the life of Jesus and we see the model for discipleship. It's very simple. It's, it's relationship. It's him relating with his students. And as they spend time together, they kind of rub off on each other. You know, they're, they're still individuals, but they become more like, you know, they, the disciples become more like the master. This happens with us all the time. We've been married for 23 years, and they get the right. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> It's not, I just want to make sure, you know. <laughs> Keep going, okay. <laughs> so, I will think something. And then Ivetka will turn to me and say, so, whatever, I'm thinking, you know. <laughs> you know, the same topic that I'm thinking about. And as far as I can tell, there was nothing to give her a hint about what I was thinking, you know? <laughs> Which is scary, it's like she can read my mind, right? <laughs> <laughs> But it happens the other way around, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just more quiet about it. <laughs> Right. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of cool, actually. Right? Because we're becoming one flesh, you know, one... You know, and we're, we, we rub off on each other, right, over time. 
you know, it just kind of naturally works that way. I think it's as we spend time with Jesus. We start to think his thoughts. We start to do things his way. We come a little less like us, a little bit more like him. And, and maybe part of that making disciples is just you discipling someone. You being that physical, tangible person who can just share Jesus and let him rub, come from you and rub off on them. So we preach and we witness. We make disciples. So it's also, he said baptize, right? Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is super important. It's this outward sign of an inward change or allegiance. <coughs> In the New Testament, baptism was a very common thing. This is not something that Jesus made up or created. It's actually in the Jewish culture, this idea of baptism. And people got baptized for all sorts of things. You know, whenever, maybe there was a change in their lifestyle. Maybe there was a repentance for sin. Maybe they were following a, a certain rabbi or a certain teaching or entering into a certain community. And, and people would immerse themselves in water. They would be baptized. As a sign of, I'm leaving this behind and I'm starting this new thing. And you were baptized into something. And we're told here we need to baptize people into the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And in a way, what Jesus is saying is, you know, we're, we're becoming identified with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And as we lead people to God, we, we want to lead people into that identification of the Trinity. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And it's, imp- it's an important point because sometimes it doesn't happen. I've, I've, I've been to churches where only God the Father is talked about. Or only Jesus. Only the Holy Spirit. Or I've been to other churches like this. I, I literally was in the church once where I, I was with a guest speaker. This guy's a really like, he's, he's not very, he's not a very charismatic speaker, very level, okay? But he's speaking, he's speaking about the Holy Spirit. And I see that all the elders are sitting in the front. And I could physically see them cringe. They did not like the Holy Spirit being mentioned in the, in the church. <laughs> they had not identified with the Holy Spirit at all. You, know? you could physically see it. And that's not what Jesus is calling us to. He says we need to be, you know, we need to be immersed with the, identifying with our loving Heavenly Father. 
a musíme byť vnorení z toho, že sa identifikujeme s našim milujúcim Bohom Otcom. We need to have a personal relationship with our Messiah, our hero, Jesus. Musíme mať osobný vzťah s našim hrdinom, s našim Mesiášom, Pánom Ježišom. We need to experience the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. We need to experience all of who God is. And, and, and align our lives with Him. One last thing we're told to do on this mission. Teach to obey. Notice he says, teach not to educate. Teach not to amass knowledge. Teach not to win at Bible trivia. But teach so that it can be lived out or obeyed. to do God's word. You know, I, I know some people who know the Bible forward and back. I've read some books from theologians who know the Bible so good. But they openly have doubts about that God exists. They have the knowledge, but they don't have the faith. And they don't have the obedience. And we're told to teach in a way that helps people obey. Our teaching should be not just informative, but inspirational. And applicable. Right? right, because we know that these are the words of life. They're words that are supposed to be lived by. I think it's in James' letter where he says, you know, um, when you hear God's word and you don't do it, you're not fooling anyone and you're not fooling God. But you are making a fool of yourself. Right? And that's a bad paraphrase, but you know, you get the idea. <laughs> you know, and, and that's what, if we, if we hear God's word and we don't do it, it's kind of useless. So let's teach to obey. We're going to just wrap things up. So we're on this co-mission, this mission with Jesus. In the uh, account of the ascension where Jesus is taken up to heaven in Acts chapter 1, The writer Luke says, Dear Theophilus, dear lover of God, I wrote to you what Jesus began to do and teach. All the way until the day he was taken up to heaven. And this says he was taken before our very eyes. And a cloud hid him from our sight. And then his account turns to the disciples. Says they were looking intently at the sky to see where he was going. So sudden, suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, two angels. Said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking in the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken away from you, he's going into heaven. And he's going to come back the same way from heaven. 
And I like that passage in Acts. Because it indicates that Jesus was working and he continues to work through us. And Jesus ascends, right? And the guys are looking up. And the angels are like, almost like, what are you looking at? Why are you just standing around looking up? Get to work. <laughs> He just finished telling you what your mission is. <laughs> Why are you looking in the sky? Get to work. And keep doing it until he comes back. Small story. I read this uh, uh, article a few months ago. It's about this guy. I'm going to name him. His name is, it's a Japanese name, so I'm going to get it wrong, okay? Hiro Ohanda. Okay, Hiro. Oh, yeah, okay. So, anyways, he was a interesting guy. He was a Japanese intelligence officer. During World War II. And he was sent on a mission in the Philippines. And he was to lead this kind of resistant movement and do guerrilla warfare. And, and, he, and he goes there and he's doing his thing, he's doing his mission. And then, like, shortly after, the war actually ends. The problem is, he didn't know the war ended. And he's out in the jungles, and he's just keep doing what he's doing. And the Allied forces, they send some pamphlets down in Japanese saying, the war is over. <laughs> And he read it, he thought, ah, oh, they're just trying to trick me. And then he kind of came over, the, over some time in contact with some people, they told him the same thing. And he didn't believe it. He kept fighting World War II for 29 years. World War, World War II was four years long. <laughs> He fought for 29 years. He didn't stop until the Japanese government found his commanding officer who had given him his mission. He's an old man now, he's like in his 80s. His, this commander. And he, he, they bring him to the Philippines, they find this guy, and the commander has to tell him, the mission is finished. And then he gives over his gun and his grenades and his sword. <laughs> The point I'm trying to make here is he got a mission and he did it until he was told not to do it anymore. Until his commander came back. <laughs> and told him the mission is done. So, don't look to the sky. Get out there. Do the mission until your commander comes and gives you some different instructions. Make sense? Yeah, okay. So, let's do this. Um, I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. And uh, we're going to have one more song of worship and then uh, one more thing. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that um, 
you've come in power. You're with us all the way to the end. Lord, help us to, rem- to remember you're with us. Lord, just awe us, Lord. Make us just so stunned by who you are. That we would just want to talk about you. That it wouldn't be something that would come unnaturally, but just naturally and supernaturally. So we just invite you to do that by the power of your Holy Spirit. In your wonderful name. Amen. Store